throughout the day. Take your Bible this evening, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter number 2. 1 Peter chapter number 2. And when you find 1 Peter 2 and verse number 13, if you will stand and we will honor the reading of God's word this evening. 1 Peter chapter number 2, verse number 13. First Peter 2, verse 13, here's what Peter writes. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Let's pray. Lord, <clears throat> we are grateful again for uh, the scripture. We're thankful for the truth. Lord, this is difficult to do at times. It's difficult to kind of carry out. Uh, what you have commanded us to do here, but yet that does not exclude us from being obedient. So help us to understand the reason why, and then, Lord, may we be obedient in what you've called us to do. We'll be grateful again. Thank you for salvation, and then the strength that you give us to do what you're calling us to do here in this passage, and we'll be grateful. We ask these things this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Would you get me a bottle of water, please? Thank you. My voice may not make it to or past the introduction. And the Lord's people said, Amen. All right. First word of verse number 13. Uh, it's, it's a difficult word. We, we, again, we tend to think of submission or submitting as a bad thing. But as we read our Bible, we understand that submission is something that you and I are commanded to do. It's just expected that we would be submitting ourselves to the ordinance, to, to the command, the, the uh, uh, scripture passages, these, these orders that God is giving to us. Now, again, submitting ourselves to divine authority, okay, we understand that. I get, that's what I'm supposed to do. But when it comes to, 1 Peter chapter number 2, beginning in verse number 13, when it comes to something like submitting myself to civil authority, I don't really want to do that. Especially when I don't agree with what the civil authority is doing. <laughs> Which is, um, most of the time, I don't agree. All right, um, If you... This is just an example for my own personal um, confessions, all right? <laughs> when I drive on 290 going back toward our home in Maynard, or when I'm coming from home to the church here, uh, they built some apartments up on the hillside, and they're, they're nice places and all that, but uh, someone in their um, lack of infinite wisdom put a stoplight right there, and rather than making that an on-demand stoplight, which means, well, if there's a car, then we can cycle through. If there's not a car, there's no need to stop traffic from moving. And I don't know if there's some evil genius at the Department of Transportation that sees my vehicle coming. But every time I pass that little road, or I'm getting ready to pass, the light turns. Now, I've never seen a police officer there, not one time. And in my, um, my desire is just to right on through there. There's nobody even coming. Why are we stopped? There's no cars there. But Brother John Morrell, I'm supposed to stop at a red light. Why? Because the civil authority told me, you need to stop at a red light. That doesn't excuse my bad-mouthing the Department of Transportation in my vehicle while I'm stopped at the light either. I'm not supposed to do those, those kinds of things, all right? 
hopefully you understand you all might be able to share your own illustration. Some of you drive Mopac and you, uh, we're not going to go down that road right now. Literally down that road. Good, a couple of you got it. All right, so as you read your scripture then, as you read the Bible, you're never going to come across where Jesus is organizing protests against the civil authority of the day. We, we don't read of the disciples of the Lord storming the gates of Caesar's palace, not the one in Las Vegas, but the one in Rome. <laughs> we don't read them storming the gates of the palace, demanding what they think is their rights. All right? um, there was no demand from the Lord to tear up a speech if you didn't like it. Really? That's all that I got on that? Man, I thought that would be better. <laughs> Instead, I would guess that or think that the more realistic response would be that we would be surprised when the civil authority ever does line up with what we would see to be right or honest or according to or in line with God's word. That should be the, the instance where we, we are surprised by those things, but it, it seems like from, from our perspective, most of us want to get disgusted when the government or when the civil authority does things that we don't agree with and we, we can't believe it. We're just, we're blown out of the water that this might take place. We should be surprised when it does line up. We, we should have the perspective that, man, we're, we're thankful when at least it does line up with God's word or with God's truth rather than get angry when it does not as much as me, we might want to get angry. Isn't it fun to get angry? <laughs> yeah, we like that more than being kind or just submitting ourselves, which is what we're commanded to do in verse number 13. So think about the author of this epistle. Think about Peter. At one time, he tried to take matters into his own hands. But notice what he says, the very first part of verse number 13. Submit yourselves. You submit yourselves. You find yourself. You, you bring your body into subjection. You bring your emotion into subjection that you submit yourselves to civil authority. And he says so, first of all, because number one, it is a command from all, Almighty God. This is not a suggestion. He's telling you and I to submit. But he also gives us the best motivation for submission right there again in verse number 13. Remember what that is. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. Why? For the Lord's sake. Not so you look better, but because this is what the Lord wants you to do. And I do these things because God wants me to do them. And lest we forget the civil authority or the government around us is not our means of salvation. It's not our means of deliverance. I, I'm not to be looking to the civil government for um, help on my, in my way of doing things. Again, I ought to just expect that it's probably not going to be that way. I need strength. I need salvation, and I do not look to the government around me or whoever is in authority around me to give, be able to give that to me. Now, should I be praying for civil government? Yes. Should I be engaged in civil government? Yes. Should I also be submitting to it? Yes. We ought to play our part in in influencing the government around us. And again, why? It's not just submission for submission's sake, but it is because we are supposed to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. And if you, if you mark your Bible or you're taking notes, you might write an arrow from verse 13 down to verses 21 through verse number 25. Because verses 21 through 25, Peter finishes this, this part of his letter by again illustrating, and here's what Jesus has done. Here's how he acted. Here's how he behaved himself. Verse 13, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, 
whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king." Am I supposed to live this way to please the government? Or am I supposed to live this way to please Almighty God? To please God. And if I'm pleasing God, then quite honestly, it doesn't matter as much who I am displeasing. But if I am displeasing God, what good is pleasing the government going to get me, honestly? Really nowhere. So we looked again last week, the... The, the commandment of motivation or the commandment of, of submission and then the motivation for submission. So here's where we need to get to tonight. I want you to see the extent of our submission. How far or to whom are we supposed to submit? And it's found in verse number 13. Verse 13. Submit yourselves. Now you're ready. To every ordinance. Of man. How far should we take this thing? Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Now, here's some practical application. Whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. What is Peter saying? You and I are to submit ourselves to the law of the land. What is the law of the land? I'm supposed to submit myself to those things. Why? Because God has put those measures in place. Uh, he has put the government in place. Ideally, again, ideally is the key word, to maintain peace and order in our society. Well, how come we don't see peace and order? I said ideally. <laughs> God created all the foundations of human society. Think about what those are. Work. God instituted work in the Garden of Eden before the fall of man. Sometimes we like to think, well, now I have to work because Adam sinned. Now look, I got a sweat on my brow. No, no. Work was instituted before sin. Adam was given the garden to tend it, to take care of it. Now it was just going to get harder. So he's instituted work, he's instituted the family, he's instituted the government. And for us to make exceptions in any of those things is to condone disobedience and it is to have disrespect for God's plan. So um, you watch your children rebel, maybe against you, maybe against some other form of authority. And in your mind you think, I wonder where they got that. Man, where'd they learn that? Must have been their mother, must have been their father, whatever we, we kind of say about that. But can I just ask you a question? In front of your own children, are you displaying submission to the civil authority around you? Or have they learned how to badmouth somebody who you don't like or what they are doing? Okay, I'm going to sit in the pew because... My children have heard me badmouth that light on 290 Access Road many times. In fact, it's almost humorous for them uh, when we stop. And I can't look at them when they rebel and say, boy, I wonder where they learned that, or I wonder why they learned to talk back. They learned it right here from me. Because I haven't been submitting myself. I haven't been um, acting as I should act. And this command that Peter gives us here in 1 Peter chapter number 2 does not exclude the authorities who uh, make bad or unjust decisions. It doesn't say submit yourself to, to every uh, ordinance of man for the Lord's sake except when they make a bad decision then you can go out and do whatever it is you, you think is best. No, there's, there's no exception there. By the way, do we read about Let's just take the Old Testament, where there were rulers 
or civil authorities who made bad, unwise, unjust decisions all the time. All the time. Think about Daniel. Think about, uh, uh, what else? The, the, the book of Micah is all about that, making unjust decisions. Uh, if you read the book of Habakkuk, Habakkuk is mad at God because God has chosen to use an unjust authority to bring judgment onto God's people. And Habakkuk gets to the point where he is about um, rebuking the Lord almost. He's questioning God, why would you do this? They don't even do what's right. Until God says, excuse me, I'm on the throne here. You didn't set up any of this. I know exactly what I am doing. And we get to Habakkuk chapter number three and he says, it is better for me to keep my mouth shut and to let God do the work that God can do because God knows better than what I know. Amen. That's a good place for one right there. So, okay, let, let me ask you. Do, do you and I, or do not you and I, trust that God is sovereign and perfectly wise to rule over every society and over every nation? Do you think that he is able or do you not think that he is able? Well, I hope you would say, I think he is able, I believe he is able, but then why don't we behave like that? Why do we get bent out of shape when somebody does something we don't agree with? Now, I'm not saying, well, you ought to just agree with it and go along with it. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying I ought to submit to those authorities around me. And I ought to be praying for them and, and somehow engaged in my civil government so that I can, I can have a voice against those kinds of things. But I remember what, what Abraham would ask the Lord in Genesis 18. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Yes, he will every time. And so notice what Peter then says here in, in the verses. It applies to all levels of authority. From the highest authority, the king, do you see that? The king as supreme. Okay, um, how about... Um, the Caesar at the time of this writing, the uh, dictator, the president, whether he has an R after his name or a D after his name or an I or an L or whatever part of the alphabet you prefer or don't prefer. Do I trust that God can rule and reign? Can I trust that he is sovereign and perfectly wise to do what he knows to be best in the sake of the king or the matter of the king? But the verse goes on, verse 14. Or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him, that would be the king, for the punishment of evildoers, for the praise of them that do well. Okay, so I'm supposed to be um, submitting myself to the king as supreme or even to those who are below the king, who the king sends out to make sure that the rules are enforced. And the, the, the God-given position, verse 14, is what? Well, for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. I, I, I can hear your little minds right now. Just like, yeah, but that's not what's going on here. The evil are the ones being rewarded. And the ones who are trying to do right are the ones who are unjustly treated. Okay, uh, hold your place in First Peter. And turn back to Matthew's gospel. Gospel of Matthew Verse 26, uh, chapter 26 rather, Matthew 26, verse 50. Matthew 26, verse number 50. Matthew 26, 50 is the account of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
Verse 50, Matthew 26. And Jesus said unto him, what's the word used there? Friend. Do you see that? Do you know who Jesus is speaking to and he says friend? Judas Iscariot, who has just betrayed him. Now, most of us, if somebody betrayed us, are either one, going to punch him in the face if they're right there, or two, we're going to come up with some plot or plan to get back at him. Jesus calls him friend. Wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on, uh, laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priests and smote off his ear. Time out. Who's that? Peter. The same one who's writing 1 Peter. Talking about being in submission to those in authority. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Time out. Government has been given the authority for capital punishment. Not you. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? Don't you think I can handle myself, Peter? Don't you think I can take care of business? What you don't understand, Peter, is it isn't time for that right now. Sometimes I just, I wonder if we in in good Bible preaching, Bible believing churches, we find more uh, pleasure in downing or demeaning the civil authority around us, thinking that we are the ones standing for what is right, when God is the one who is saying, you submit yourself and you pray for them. I didn't ordain them to just treat you like a bunch of, you know, like you're the best or the greatest. I do these things for a reason and for a purpose. How many times do you and I read in the Bible where God used even a pagan king to bring about his plan? Do you think that God could use someone like, um, I don't know, a president you don't agree with to bring about his plan, his will? That's not a problem for him. And sometimes, boy, we get um, high blood pressure watching a State of the Union address. How do you know? Did you see me? No, I was getting high blood pressure. Because what Peter says is only the government, by inspiration of the Lord, only the government has been given the authority to punish lawbreakers. We're not into vigilante justice, though it makes for good movie plots. You can write down Romans 13 and verse number 4. You can go back and read it. We won't read that here for sake of time. But by the same token, then, Peter says that God has appointed civil officials. Notice, for the praise of them that do well. We're back in 1 Peter chapter number 2. For the praise of them that do well. That's the last phrase in verse number 14. Okay, so again, generally speaking, the authorities around us reward good citizenship with fair and favorable treatment. I know, not always, I know. But there's still no exception to the command that has been given to me as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Doesn't it make sense that we should approach or try to fix the social ills of our day by first dealing with the spiritual ills of our day. Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount. You don't have to turn there. Let me read it for you. Again, remember what the Sermon on the Mount is about. It is not about how to be saved or get saved. It is how you act after you are saved. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. That's what the religious crowd wanted them to do. Um, That's what many Christian people do. Yeah, I'm silent about that too. But I, Jesus says, but I say unto you, love 
your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Why? That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. In other words, so that you would show the relationship that you have with your Father. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good. And sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. That's God's prerogative to be able to do. It's not your prerogative to get to say who should and who should not. And by the way, if you want to do that or have a part in that, then can I encourage you to run for public office? We could use a few good ones. Ooh, that was quite, okay, good, one, one, good. Um, we know who to vote for when they begin to run, all right. So the only examples then we see in the scripture of not obeying are when we are called on to violate morality or our obedience to God. Here's what I mean. Uh, the example of Daniel, right? He knew the law, but it would cause him to violate his obedience to God. And so he would rather obey God than man. That's what we ought to be doing. How about the three Hebrews? Called on to violate obedience to God, called on to violate morality by bowing down to a false idol. They, they refused to do that. Peter was told not to preach anymore in Jesus' name, and yet he continued to do that because he ought to obey God rather than men. If you remember, here's a, a little bit of an obscure one. You remember when King Saul ordered his bodyguard to kill all the priests or the servants in the, in the temple or the tabernacle? And he refused to do it. Why? Because it violated morality and obedience to God. Those are the only times when we see that the Bible uh, gives an example of an exception. Other than that, you're, you're treated badly and somebody disagrees with your viewpoint. Submit to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Well, you seem pretty angry about it. I'm just saying, I don't know that we have helped our testimony as Christians very much by arguing and complaining and yelling and screaming and putting all kinds of things on Facebook about government leaders or government officials. I don't agree with them, but I ought to be praying for them. I ought to be submitting myself to them because God has put them in place. It is up to God to rise up and to put down. So then, okay, the extent of our submission, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be unto the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. Why then? What is the reason? Look at verse 15, 1 Peter chapter number 2. For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish man. Now it's pretty simple to understand from verse number 15. It is the will of God that Christians have their well-doing, they're, they're respecting, they're submitting to authority in their life to be used to what? Put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. And the word silence is a great word. It means to restrain or to muzzle, literally to render speechless. And it has with it kind of a word picture of putting a gag in somebody's mouth or, or rendering that person incapable of response. So what does Peter say? Well, think about verse number 15. So is the will of God that with well-doing, do you see that? Not angry posting, <laughs> not uh, frustrated um, civil disobedience. No, that with well-doing. Ye may put to silence, <laughs> muzzle, completely render speechless the ignorance of foolish men. Now the ignorance in verse 15 of these foolish men is not a lack of knowledge, but rather it is a willful, hostile rejection to what the truth is from the word of God. 
it is being senseless without reason. Just because I disobey with God's word, I'm going to totally ignore or, or be angry or to reject everything that has anything to do with it. That is the ignorance of foolish men in verse number 15. And Peter uses the word again with these folks who act like that as foolish. Psalm 14, 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. These foolish people act like there is no God in the world. All right? So, again, I hear the squirrel wheel starting to turn again. Isn't that what we see in our government? Yes. Yes, it is. But we don't rebel against it. We don't try to organize a coup against it. We, in the will of God, do well. Period. So that we might put those who believe there is no God or act like there is no God, who want nothing to do with or to hear anything about what God would have them to do, we put them to silence. So, then what the scripture is saying is that things like integrity, impeccable moral fiber, and a purity of life are effective character tools to muzzle the enemies of Christianity. You're close. Hold your place again in 1 Peter. Look back at Titus. Go back a few pages to the left to the book of Titus. Titus chapter number 3. Again, I I know you didn't like last week's. Um, You didn't enjoy it very much. Neither did I. But you didn't get it very well, so we're Keep it on going on. All right. That's a joke. I don't just hammer you just to hammer you. Is that what you think? Well, here he goes. He's mad again. Titus 3. Look at verse 1. This is Paul's instruction, again, to a pastor who's leading a church. And here's what he tells this young man, Titus, to, to preach and to teach. Put them, that is the folks in the church, put them in mind to be Subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no <laughs> no brawlers. Now I'm going to fight you over that, but gentle. Showing all meekness unto all men. That doesn't mean you're milk toast. That means your power under control. For we ourselves also were sometimes who? We were sometimes foolish. Oh, surely nobody in this church. Disobedient? Yeah. Yeah. You see the next one? Deceived. Serving diverse lusts and pleasures. Living in... Wow. Like like your happy place is being angry about stuff. Living in malice and envy. Hateful. And hating one another. That's what they used to be. Now they're not because they stopped doing it. No. Now they're not because God has changed their life. And they realize that because God has changed my life, I should behave on the outside like the truth that has happened on the inside. So, church members, be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. You don't have to respond when the fool opens his mouth. You don't have to. Well, he needs to know. Well, the Bible example is that God is the judger and the bringer of justice to those, not me. Now, I'm not saying or trying to combat when somebody might need to be rebuked or exhorted in some matter. 
But I believe that's a separate issue from what we're talking about here this evening and in this, this passage of Scripture. God says there is no better testimony before the enemies of Christ than for His children to walk in submission and in obedience to the authorities above them. And by the way, I don't believe that that just means the civil authority or the government authority. I believe that means the boss at your workplace. That one went over about as well as the others. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse number 15. See that none render evil for evil unto any man. But ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. That's the reason for our submission. We saw the extent of our submission. Let's finish with the, uh, we'll, we'll go one more. The attitude of our submission. Look at verse number 16. We're almost done. The attitude of our submission. In what way should we be submissive? See the first two words of verse 16? <laughs> As free. So you and I display the right attitude when we act what or how? As free. But I want you to read the whole verse and I want you to think of that word free and look at the end of the verse here as we read verse 16. As free... And not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Are we free or are we servants? Is, is the Bible contradicting itself? Are we free or are we servants? Yes. We are free. The blood of Jesus Christ has made us free from the bondage of sin, from, from sin's condemnation, from the penalty of the law, from the bondage of, of Satan himself, from, from the control of the world, from the power of death. We're free from all of those things. But we are not to use freedom, verse number 16, as a cloak or a cover for wickedness and misbehavior. Well, I'm free. Yeah, so act like you're free as a servant of God. I'm not supposed to have a rotten attitude towards submission or toward authority that has been placed in my life. Why? Because what I believe Peter is saying in 1 Peter 2 and verse number 16 is that my freedom is for serving God and others. Not to just rip off the latest, uh, you know, burn on somebody else. Burn, does anybody still use that word anymore? That was cool. Show my age a little bit. And that word servant is the same word that Paul would use regularly, and it's regularly in the New Testament, the word for slave. For God's children, it describes the glorious freedom to be servants of Christ and to do what is right. I now have the freedom to choose to do right rather than just continually doing what is wrong. That's what Peter is saying here. You act as a free person. And you are free to be a servant of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I want you to see this verse. Look at 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians 7, verse number 22. And when we bring these verses in, we're trying to use our Bible to interpret our Bible. Does it say this same thing anywhere else? Yes, plenty of places. 1 Corinthians 7, look at verse 22. One Corinthians seven twenty two, for he that is called in the Lord, being a excuse me, servant, is the Lord's. <laughs> uh, am I a servant or a free man? Yes. Likewise, also he that is called, being free, is Christ's servant. See, you're made free to serve Him, not to serve yourself. You served yourself in bondage before Christ came in. Why would that be freedom anymore? I'm free to listen to whatever I want to, free to say whatever I want to, free to go anywhere I want to. Really? Because you did that before. What difference did Christ make in your life? Why should you go back to that? It makes absolutely no sense. But in today's Christianity, that's what everyone's fighting for. Now I get to do this. I can drink now because I've been made free. We well, could have drank before that, and you didn't even have to have the guilt along with it. I'm just, I'm just trying to be honest. 
But we, we fight so much to be free and we act like we're bond slaves because we're under bondage of some president or some monarch somewhere or some dictator. We don't act like we are the children of God. So then verse 17, the last verse of our passage is what? The application then. Here's, here's what we do. Number one, it's so simple. Honor all men. In other words, every person is created in God's image and therefore is due our respect. Honor all men. All men. All men. Now, ladies, I'm not saying that or trying to emphasize that because it's just about men. No, this is all of humankind. By the way, men, we don't do well if we quote verses on submission to our wives and we don't submit ourselves to them because that's what the verse says just before in Ephesians 5 verse 22. Submit yourselves one to another in fear of the Lord. Respect, honor all men. Number two, right there in verse number 17. You could write the outline. Love the brotherhood. How, how do I submit? How do I show my submission? Honor all men, love the brotherhood, okay? So we should be showing the world around us that we love other people who believe like us. I'm mad at people at my church. They just, you know, they're doing something that I just, I don't agree with. I don't like it. Just mad at them. You know, they didn't say hello or they didn't, they didn't acknowledge me or I didn't get re rewarded or whatever the case may be. I'm not against rewards. Please don't misunderstand. But listen, I am supposed to love the brotherhood. And when I'm trying to invite someone for I Love My Church Sunday, and at the same time I am bad-mouthing the people on the other side of the pew, oh, I can't wait to go to that place. <laughs> Sounds so fun. Love the brotherhood. You love one another. This is your church family. You love each other. We are working together, not trying to tear the place apart. Loving the brotherhood. John 13, here's what Jesus said. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Honor all men, love the brotherhood. Third, how do I apply this? Fear God. This includes trusting him in all circumstances, no matter how difficult they might be. Fear God. It encourage us, encourages us to submit ourselves to these authorities. Why? Because we are ultimately respecting the one who has commanded us to do so. I love God and I'll do whatever it is he wants me to do. But I can't stand these civil authorities. Excuse me, you're called to submit yourself to them. And not to speak evil of any man. You're supposed to honor all men. So you can't ultimately say that you love God when you disobey his commandments. It, it doesn't work that way. You can't have both. But in our brand of Christianity, in the day and time in which we live, we have separated ourselves so far from the, the, the person who either one is lost and doesn't get any of this, or the, the person who is saved but they're away from the Lord and they, they don't understand the Bible well enough to make the application into their everyday life. And we've distanced, our, we've distanced ourselves so far from them that there's no hope of us ever ministering or serving them. Because, well, they, they're angry about it. I mean, they're, they're Christians and they're mad about it. And, and it's not necessarily us, although it could be us, but it is plenty of churches like ours that their name in town is more known for being mad about things than about honoring all men, loving the brotherhood, fearing our God. Because the fear of God will always drive out the fear of man. Always. Proverbs 9 and verse number 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Fourth and finally, in, in applying this passage, in implying, applying this principle, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God. Fourth, what does it say? Honor the king. You see how we made a full circle now back to verse number 13? 
Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be unto the king as supreme. Here's what Solomon would do to instruct his own son, Proverbs 24 and verse number 21. My son, fear thou the Lord and the king, and meddle not with them that are given to change. In other words, don't be found in league with those who are always trying to overthrow everything so that they can have their way. No, you fear the Lord and the king. Was every king in Israel good? In fact, the minority of them were good over God's people. And yet God's man said, son, you fear the Lord and you honor the king. When, here's a step in the other direction from this past Monday night. When it is the right time, you reach out your hand and you shake somebody's hand and you look them in the eye. You give them respect. It's not right if we don't do that. God loved Nero, who was persecuting and killing his children. He loved Nero as much as he loved Peter. He loved Paul as much as he loves you. So in verse 17 then, as we think about honoring all men, loving the brotherhood, fearing God, and honoring the king, all of those, and I'm not going to go deep into this, but all of those verb tenses have the indication that we should constantly maintain those things. In other words, keep doing it. Honor all men and keep doing it. Love the brotherhood and keep doing it. Fear God, keep doing it. Honor the king. You ready? Keep doing it. Keep doing it. And let's not use the fact that, well, you know, it's not easy. Well, it's hard, you know, in the day and time in which we live, it's hard to honor the, the civil government, and so we use that as an excuse to not do it. No, don't use an excuse to, that it, it isn't easy to keep you from doing what God has commanded you to do. Even when it doesn't make sense to you, for the sake of the Lord and for our testimony, God commands you and I, this is what you should do. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be unto the king as supreme or unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God. If you read this passage and just at face value... It is pretty simple to understand. Pretty simple, pretty easy to understand. And it was not written at a time when uh, Christianity was in a favorable position. By the way, when has that ever been the case? Except when some uh, foreign version of quote-unquote Christianity was made the state religion. That was never God's intention, by the way. Submit yourselves. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. How you doing? How you doing? Well, I'll honor the brotherhood, but I don't, that other stuff, I don't sound into that. Then don't call yourself an obedient child. You, you can't. Don't, don't fool yourself or pull the wool over your eyes. In fact, that's exactly what Peter is talking about. When he says in verse number 16, using your liberty as a cloak of maliciousness, you're, you're covering up your evil deeds by trying to portray some other side or some other view. Don't do that. Don't do that. Because God knows what's going on under that cloak. He knows. He knows. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. These are not popular ideas it's difficult to even preach it to be quite honest and Lord you, you know the struggle that I've had in my own heart about these things help me to lead this church to do what it is we should do rather than just doing what is popular or to get an amen Lord please help us to trust you help us not to get fearful or 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 
uh, needing of even medication to, to treat us because we're so tight up and we're so wound up about the things of the, the, the earth and what's going on around us. Help us, please, to be...